Thousands flee Libya tonight. Many remain to face a brutal regime and plan for an uncertain future. My next guest has been talking to many of the holdouts day and night throughout this crisis, and he has a big stake in a post-Qaddafi era. Mansour El Kikia is an exiled Libyan opposition leader. His brother was the first Libyan ambassador to the United States, and his cousin, a foreign minister for Gaddafi who turned on the leader, disappeared in 1993 and is believed to have been executed by the regime. Professor El Kikia is a professor of political science at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Professor, thank you so much for being here. First question. Libya is on the verge or is in the midst of a civil war. We in the United States are itching to do something. From your perspective, what should we do? Uh, nothing, Elliot. That's the very hard. <laughs> I, know, I know it's very difficult indeed. I know. But the truth is I don't want to see Libya used as a, as a, as a ball between in, in American politics. And yesterday what I've been watching is that it was Republicans being the Democrats for not doing enough, Democrats blaming Republicans for trying asking to do too much too fast. And so I want what I would really very much like to, to, to see happen. I like the Libyans to resolve this issue by themselves, which means a number of things. First, no, no airstrikes, no invasion, military troops. You don't need to go there. The Libyans are willing to put their lives on the line, and they are. The United States can provide military aid if it wants to, at least to shoot down those planes, if it doesn't want to have a, it wants to have a, a no strike, no, 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 fly zone, no fly zone. And what most important is to provide economic support, help, food, medicines, running very short. Okay, well, let me parse this a little bit, because okay. there are reports late today that certain voices in the, in the Libyan opposition, the leaders of the revolt, are saying to the West, we need airstrikes. So first, what are you hearing in your conversations back to those in Libya about what's happening militarily? Are you winning? Is the revolt winning? The revolt is winning. I've talked to the, into the head of the provincial government in Libya. And they don't... Who is that? Who is the head? Is it, uh, 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 his, his name, his name is, 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 is a bit... Do you have his phone number? Can we call him right now? You know, actually, I do have his phone number. If you'd like to call him, I'd be more than happy to give you his phone number All to right, call him. So, so <laughs> what is his name and what, what, what has he said about the military condition? He said he does, he does, not, want, he does not want military strikes by, by, by Americans or anyone else. His name is, is, is Mustafa Abdel Jalil. And, and okay. how was he deemed to be the leader of the revolution? Who well, is he? A, what do we he, know about him? He's a judge. He's a judge and he's a wise man. And he was selected by a number of the, the, the others to, 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 head the, to head the government. And he does not see a need for, for American or, or European intervention in Libya right now. What he does need, as I said, is the ability to fight to level the playing field. And to level the playing field is to provide him, if you want, military hardware to shoot down those planes if they come. But most important is to provide the necessary sub medical supplies and medical help because foods are run, is running short. Look, we will, in fact, try to reach him shortly, but uh, look, in terms of a no-fly zone then, you say that's fine, but do you fear that, that Gaddafi is, is creating a, a position of strength in Tripoli and this could devolve into a civil war with thousands and thousands of casualties? Well, he hasn't left Tripoli, but I've always said that Gaddafi has two choices, either to leave, Tripoli, leave Libya peacefully or leave Libya with 15 or 20,000 people with him. But you see, he's going to leave Libya with 20,000 people with him. But don't forget, Elliot, he's been there for 40 years. I mean, you want miracles to happen in two days? This is not, this is not a Hollywood movie. This, 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 is, this is where your sense of patience <laughs> yes. is, is showing us a yeah. few things. Yeah. Let, let me ask you another question, because there are also reports late this afternoon that there were negotiations that were beginning between the head of the revolution and Gaddafi, did, did uh, you hear any of that when you spoke to the head of the revolution? No, it did not happen. None of that is happening. I think much of this is Gaddafi's, Gaddafi's own propaganda machine doing this. I mean, they, they, he's still there with a very powerful set of troops. Troops are still coming in. Mercenaries are coming into the south from Sabha, city of Sabha. He is he's armed to the teeth. But the bigger problem, too, is, which he's beginning to face now, like others, is shortages in food. In Tripoli, he's been to shelves are emptying out. He gave people money, okay, mm -hmm. but they have nothing to buy. So you think the food shortage is what will lead to a crisis in, within the population? I've never seen in my life, you know, any regime deal with food shortages and food riots. Now, he is creating the food shortage. He has told his military to fire at his own public. Who within the general public is still supportive of him? Very few. But what can you do? He has a prison over there. 
He packs up the kids and all those what he perceives to be agitators, puts them in prison, and he, he thinks he's having control. But you see, he hasn't moved out. Last night I was listening to direct line, telephone line with Musrata, mm -hmm. and I was hearing the firing. The, to the, the city of Musrata? The city of Musrata. There's actually a base over there, the training base. Half of the troops left the base, they joined the group, the other half is still loyal to, to the regime, and they wouldn't give up. And they were firing up in the air to scare everyone from coming close. Now, when we have seen Gaddafi interviewed over the last few days, in fact, I would say farther back than that, months and years, he appears, not to use the clinical term, he appears crazy. D d does, does the public in Libya share this view? Honestly, we've been saying this for the last 30 years. So, Nobody believed us. No, no, we believe, but, well, maybe we should have believed you earlier, but here's my question then. If this is the image of the leader of the nation, why is the military remaining loyal to him? Well, it's because he made very sure that not only the military, what is remaining to him are the revolutionary committees. And the revolutionary committees, he made it very clear to them very, very early on. If I go, you go. There is no way around that. Now, there have, but there have been some defections. There have been some in, in the Air Force, for instance, who flew their jets to Malta, others who ditched their planes in the Mediterranean. Are you hearing that the military is beginning to fracture? But that's perhaps the military. Yes, you're right. That, that's the military. But that's not his source of strength. His source of strength are the revolutionary committees, who are paramilitary groups that he has that nurtured over so many years by providing them with privileges, by providing them with assets, by providing them with... with he, they, are his, they are the group that he depends on, not the military. But, but, but these are not mercenaries. The mercenaries no. are from other countries. From other, these, these are Libyans. These are Libyan revolutionary committees that he depended on. And then you have those that are fed with the mercenaries. The army, he hollowed out in 1974. The army is useless. There is no army in Libya. You, you saw earlier in the program we talked about the refugees streaming to the borders. Yes, Egypt yes, on the east, yes, Tunisia yes, on the west. Yes. Civil society that's broken down, chaos. How much longer can this last? Honestly, you speak honestly, to the... honestly believe me, that what, you, what, you see, what you see, Libyans are, are surprising and surprising me, and they will surprise even you. They set up a system in, in the eastern of Libya where the shops are open, banks, the only thing that's open yet are schools. The, the television says satellite television will be up tomorrow. A new television station that will actually com compete with Gaddafi's television station, which is coming from his base. And you, in fact, am I right? We were chatting. You've already seen a newspaper that is beginning to come out. It's wonderful. It's a... The newspaper, was, to me, was the most fascinating thing because they the, for the first time, the, I looked at it and, and the thing that really attracted me was the date. For the first time, Libyans knew what day of the, what day of the year it was because what you have is that he, he gave the months his own names and no one knew what those months were. So what January was, what was January? And then tomorrow, I saw the first issue of the newspaper, an independent free newspaper with the dates, real dates. Very quickly, because time is short. When's uh, the last time you were back in Libya? 1980. And when do you think you'll get to go back? Next month, I hope. All right, well, good luck, Professor Kakia. Fascinating insight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having